But before we start, um, Vincenzo is going to do a little presentation. He's the one of the coordinators of the DSC DM New York 25. Thank you. Um, as they say, I'll be short and brief and then multiple pages. Uh, so the day of, uh, this day of activism started today at 5 a.m. Uh, in Turin, in Italy. Uh, we are having multiple uh, uh, events in uh, multiple cities. In uh, less than half an hour, Manchester is going to start uh, in the UK as well. And uh, we are going to close uh, the day here in New York. And uh, if you're wondering why we close an event uh, a day of uh, activism that is mostly um, uh, revolving about the uh, European elections, uh, which are going to be at the end of the, the week in New York, uh, well, of course, the time zone helped a lot, uh, so we're going to be towards the, the end of the day over there. But there is also uh, a symbolic element in, uh, in the city of New York for us uh, Europeans, uh, migrants who are here. And there are, let's say, positive and negative aspects in, uh, that we all think of when we think about this city. And of course, this city was uh, developed uh, when the Europeans aggressively stole it from the native uh, Lenape nation. Um, 400 years ago, essentially, and then it flourished on uh, slave trade and sugar trade, sugar towards uh, Europe and slaves towards the Caribbean islands. And then it further enriched itself uh, with the exploitation of the uh, European and also workers from everywhere else in the world. Um, so much that uh, uh, when, um, just in Central Park, just 100 years ago, uh, we had the so-called uh, Hooversville and the shanty towns uh, with the, during the Great Depression. But when uh, we think about New York uh, outside of this city, we also think about all the activists, all the anarchists, the unionists, and the anti-fascists who've been here uh, and have been uh, uh, even a model for the rest of the world. We know that, uh, for instance, during the uh, Spanish Civil War, there were volunteers from all the boroughs who reached uh, Spain and many many ways they uh, many of them lost their lives uh, fighting a war that wasn't uh, there to fight but just because they believed uh, in democracy and um, um, the fight against fascism this is the city of uh, that adopted in many ways Claudia Johnson and uh, Malcolm X and some of the uh, faces that you see around here at the, the People's Forum and this is of course the, also the city of uh, FDR and the actual New Deal so it is a nice place to talk about the Green New Deal uh, Diego Rivera called this essentially the city as a crossroad when he had this famous painting in, uh, at the Rockefeller Center. So this is the way we see it. There is a good side and a bad side. And they are, in a way, a representation of the fact that either we manage to have this fight across borders and across nations and across ethnic groups, or we are all going to lose it. And this is the essence of the Green Deal. So we are closing this day here in New York. Um, with this group, which is a very small group, uh, but it is uh, very active, makes a lot of noise, and we are running for the elections, uh, the European election, which is called Democracy in Europe Movement 25. And um, we all run under the umbrella of the European Spring Coalitions. Uh, we had some of the candidates who were in the previous events in, uh, in London, um, and, they, and we support their, uh, of course, their run, and there are several others, uh, among which, of course, uh, Yanis Yanni Varoufakis uh, in Germany, uh, who is campaigning now. Um, so this is essentially why the ticket for this event was in euros. You probably noticed that. So in this way, essentially, uh, thank you for your interference with the European elections. Uh, very <laughs> grateful for that. And uh, I leave now the stage to our uh, great panelists and to Costanza, who is uh, our own uh, researcher and journalist from Harvard, expert in uh, fabrication of news of various kinds. And uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Vincenzo. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, we have a fantastic panel today. Uh, we're really happy, especially because um, our goal is to talk about climate change and the Green New Deal, but to do it from different perspectives. And I think we have a, a fantastic variety of expertise and uh, different subjects matters. So we are here with uh, Andrea Carmen, uh, who is uh, the executive director of the International Indian Treaty Council, which is the first organization that had the consultative status for the UN ECOSOC. 
Uh, I've been at the UN for a few years. I've seen the, the, the work that they've done. It's uh, really fantastic. It's, uh, Andrea was one of the first uh, indigenous representatives to formally address the UN General Assembly. So this is a, a big, big achievement, and we're really happy to have her with us today. Um, David Harvey, who is uh, here uh, with us today in person. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it is really an honor. Of course, uh, most of you know, uh, know him, but just uh, quickly, he's a distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at CUNY University. Um, he has uh, authored a number of books on um, a number of different issues. Uh, I will quote only a few of them, um, like the social justice in the city on the urban geography. He is, uh, has created urban geography as a discipline. Um, we, he also authored a brief history of neoliberalism, and we hope we'll discuss neoliberalism more in depth in this discussion, and uh, rebel cities from the right to the city to the urban revolution, which we need. Um, then uh, we also have uh, Bryce Montaigne. Um, he is a climate activist. He has participated in uh, the events at the COP21. He made waves recently um, talking to the uh, parliament in Luxembourg in uh, favor against uh, plastic bags. So maybe we'll uh, discuss about how DM25, uh, he's, a, he's a member of DM25, so maybe with him we'll discuss more how DM25 in particular is approaching these issues, uh, climate change and the Green New Deal and the difference also maybe in the approach that we have in Europe and that we have in the United States and how can we um, work globally for this. And uh, Christian Parenti is, um, of course, an investigative journalism um, journalist and also an associate professor at CUNY University. Um, he has authored uh, several books on different issues and we will discuss um, we will discuss these uh, issues more in detail. Um, among the topics that he worked on, we have a prison industrial complex, surveillance and control in modern society, um, also U.S. occupation of Iraq. Uh, most recently has investigated social and political effects generated by climate change. This is a very, very important topic in a very peculiar um, take on this uh, in his book, Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change and New Geography of Violence. So um, as a start, we will start uh, with a small opening remarks from all of our um, panelists today, and then we will open to a little bit of discussion, and then we'll open to Q&A for the last part of our um, of our day together. Um, so without further ado, we can start with Andrea Carmen, and thank you very much. Thank you for your introduction. Um, I want to check that the PowerPoint is showing. It is, it is showing. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I would like to get, do some, I hope, brief opening remarks, but from the point of view of Indigenous peoples, because we were talking before we started that um, the Green New Deal is really the Green Old Deal for us. And we're looking at how to um, incorporate uh, our ways of knowing, which is another way of saying traditional knowledge. But in a way, we like it better if we're speaking English because traditional knowledge sounds like a thing that happened in the past and it's there and, you know, we, we want to regain it or, or reuse it. But our ways of knowing is much more accurate. And this came from traditional elders in Canada. Uh, and it indicates the constant uh, relationship that Indigenous people have with the natural world, which is really the source of our ability to survive and adapt what we know is coming. And to start with, I just wanted to show one example of many, uh, which is a traditional corn altar from a conference that we had on uh, Indigenous peoples and corn in Oaxaca, Mexico, um, about four years ago. And it shows uh, the four sacred colors of corn, which Indigenous people say are also the colors of of the four directions, the colors of humanity, and the four winds, but 
it's also the variety of biodiversity of indigenous people's corn that is going to help us to survive. And our elders knew ahead of time if it was going to be a wet year, a dry year, a cold year, a hot year for us, the phases of the moon, the insects, and other things. So we knew what kind of corn to plant. And that variety of sacred biodiversity is not only a spiritual understanding, but it's very, very practical in terms of our adaptability. Um, I'm going to skip uh, many, many years of our struggle for recognition and rights of the United Nations and go right to um, the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in September uh, 2007. But this is a picture, this is a, a good indication of the scope of our work, how we marched into the United Nations for the first time in 1977, and it took us 30 years to have our rights um, be recognized as collective rights of indigenous peoples, not individual human rights. The declaration is the minimum standard, and this is important for this work that we're doing at the United Nations on climate change. Uh, the minimum standard for our survival, dignity, and well-being, which means we can't go below that, whether we're working at the UN or working with countries or even municipalities and agencies. The Declaration recognizes our traditional rights to our land, territories, and resources. And again, this was adopted by the UN General Assembly, and even those four countries like uh, United States and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, have, have, that voted against it at the General Assembly have now changed their position. So no country is now uh, opposed. I don't have time to read you what this says, but this it says states shall give uh, protection and legal recognition to indigenous people's traditional lands and resources, which are all being impacted by climate change. Uh, Article 29 talks about our right to environmental protection and to maintain the productive capacity of our lands, which of course is another uh, way we're being threatened. Um, Article 20 recognizes our traditional subsistence rights and economies also being directly impacted by climate change. Uh, the Declaration recognizes our right to health and traditional health-related practices, but also talks about the, our right to conserve and maintain our vital medicines, plants, animals, and minerals also being affected by climate change. And this is very important for our activism today. Article 32 recognizes free, prior, and informed consent before development takes place on our territories. And this is, uh, of course, a demonstration against the Keystone XL pipeline, bringing um, the dirty tar sands uh, oil through the center of, of uh, the country, the indigenous communities, Indian nations, and also over the Oglala Aquifer. We have a right to participate in decision making about decisions that are made affecting our lands and rights, which means at the United Nations as well, which um, interestingly enough is sometimes just as much of a struggle as it is uh, in our home territories. Climate change directly threatens indigenous peoples, uh, food sovereignty and ways of life. This is well recognized um, in the international arena, even though it's not recognized here in the United States. Um, by the current administration. Um, we know that in uh, June 2017, the US President Trump, excuse me for um, using that word in public, but um, he pulled out, he, or he announced the US would pull out from the Paris Climate Change Agreement, joining only two other countries of not being part of the agreement. Um, he can't quite do that yet, and believe me, the United States uh, representatives are very still active in the UN climate change process, um, sometimes to the great detriment of the decisions being made there. And that matters, and I won't go into a lot of detail because of the shortness of time, um, to keep the uh, temperature rise to well below 2 degrees with a goal of 1.5 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels is vital for the survival and ways of life of indigenous peoples around the world. And this is well recognized. And we heard when we were there at COP24 in Katowice that actually uh, in 2018, global emissions increased rather than decreased despite the commitments in the Paris Agreement. And it's estimated that 
um, at the current rate, um, three degrees increase, which is about nine, nine degrees increase in the Arctic. Now, what's the impact on indigenous peoples and peoples around the world? Um, the rapporteur on the rights, uh, right to food has identified climate change as the single most important threat to world food, food security. This is a picture of salmon with skin lesions, which is a vital, um, in fact, fundamental importance for not only the culture, but uh, the nutrition of indigenous peoples um, in, on the Pacific coast. And they lost about 80% of their salmon return in 2015 because of the impacts of the rising temperatures in the Columbia River. We all know this. This is a study that just came out. Um, a million species face extinction, many of which, like the Central California Chinook Salmon Run, are vital to the identity the cultural identity, spiritual identity, as well as the nutrition and ways of life of indigenous peoples. We see also another huge factor um, that needs to be talked about more is the issue of um, climate refugees. Um, this is Shishmaref, Alaska, falling into the ocean, and Tuvalu, an indigenous nation that no longer has fresh water. But the core important factor here is as these uh, indigenous nations are forced to migrate, what will be their political identity? They change from self-determining indigenous peoples um, to migrants. Uh, so it's not just uh, a personal or family issue, it's an issue for indigenous peoples. Really quickly, I'm just going to show a couple of solutions from indigenous traditional knowledge. And one, this is a picture of a corn conference we had in Oklahoma um, with indigenous peoples from Oklahoma, Mexico, and Guatemala uh, trading seeds like we used to. Indigenous peoples have drought-resistant varieties. We have varieties naturally, no GMOs, that grow very quickly from from planting to um, harvest, which are very helpful for indigenous peoples facing instability of the climate. This is a really important slide. This, in 2015, there was a freak blizzard in South Dakota, and over 100,000 cattle died because the farmers and ranchers hadn't brought them in for the winter. But you know how many buffalo died? And a lot of tribes are restoring the, the natural animals uh, on which they depend and are very key to their culture as well. No buffalo died, not one. Buffalo can withstand the climate variances. So the restoration of our traditional food systems is going to be very key for adaptation. Of course, elders teaching our youth. This here on the left is my husband showing one of our young um, tribal members how to protect the pomegranate plants and the other one is tribal school in Alaska teaching them about the changes that are happening in gathering the wild plants because of climate change. Uh, this is a very interesting slide the the new technologies coming along and maybe the Green New Deal can assist with some of these. They're using um, air pressure to remove the salmon out of the warm water back to where they spawn and they haven't lost one single salmon. This is a uh, response uh, using new technologies, um, new sustainable uh, non-invasive technologies of indigenous peoples on the Columbia River. Protecting our sacred places. This is the Thule Marshes where a lot of our sacred sites are along the coast in California, also used for basket making. Uh, and the scientists say that these Thule Marshes absorb 10 times more carbon than a pine forest. So there's a relationship of preserving and protecting our traditional places and ways with actually um, solving climate change, establishing indigenous food sovereignty zones where we're not allowing extractives or GMOs, opposing fossil fuel based imposed development. This is Standing Rock. Everybody's heard about that. But that's one of many places where indigenous peoples are standing up against imposed fossil fuel development and supporting, and this is where the Green New Deal can come in too, a just transition to sustainable energy production. These are young people learning how to install solar panels on um, Pine Ridge Reservation. 
this is this maybe is the key that our elders have always talked about this since time immemorial. This is Roberta Blackgoat from the Navajo Nation, the Dene, who said, "Coal is the liver of Mother Earth. It has to stay in the ground so she can be healthy." So our elders and traditional peoples have been talking about climate change for generations, and our prophecies told about this time. But they also left us the solutions. So when we went to Paris. We got input from over 300,000 individuals through tribal leaders, and 96% affirmed that our traditional knowledge could be a solution. This is a picture of uh, one of the elders, Chiliazi of the Navajo Nation, speaking in the Indigenous Peoples Pavilion there in Paris at COP21. This is just some of the resistance and some of the demonstrations and activities the Indigenous Caucus had to undertake to got, get what we got. But we, in partnership with a lot of other um, constituencies, were able for the first time ever uh, in, in the Paris Agreement to get human rights and specifically the rights of Indigenous peoples recognized in a legally binding environmental UN treaty. We also, in paragraph 135, uh, had traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples be recognized as a source of adaptation and mitigation that could be useful for the planet in general. So this was very important. And as I said before, you know they're worried and scared about what's happening if finally they're reaching out to indigenous peoples. COP21, we couldn't even get in the room where negotiations were happening. We had consultations with many of the countries. This is just two, one in Canada, one in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And we had the major victory in Katowice in December just of last year, the, the new indigenous peoples and local communities platform for exchange of traditional knowledge for adaptation and mitigation to climate change was adopted. Um, this is us celebrating with the countries, many of whom has, have opposed indigenous people's direct participation, uh, like Asian countries. So just to end, this is what we were able to achieve. For the first time ever, we got direct participation of indigenous peoples in a UN body, uh, equal, seven and seven with states and indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples selected our representatives directly um, we had a strong call for a rights-based approach, and the uh, resolution that was adopted uh, at um, COP24 uh, recognizes the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in its entirety. We're going to be meeting um, for three years. There was a selection process for this new facilitative working group. Um, seven indigenous peoples and seven states to talk about how the platform um, will be advanced and how we can make sure that our traditional knowledge holders and spiritual leaders and, and traditional food growers are part of this discussion. And I'm happy to say or honored to say or um, maybe with some trepidation, but we'll see how it works. I was the uh, representative selected unanimously by indigenous peoples and tribes in North America, um, Canada and the United States to be one of the seven members. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing how that goes. We have to set right standards and safeguards for our traditional knowledge. Sharing, sharing traditional knowledge um, and resources has not worked very well for us over the last 520 some years with the settlers. But in this particular case, our elders say we have to try. And we have to try only if our rights and traditional knowledge is respected in this regard. So thank you very much. And um, I'll pass the mic to the next speaker. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrea, very much for this uh, insightful presentation. And congratulations for uh, this fantastic achievement and um, for this see responsibility. See how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yes, uh, we, we're really looking forward to see how it goes. Good, best of luck for this. Um, and now uh, we would like to hear uh, from uh, Christian Parenti. We, um, he has worked on the implications of climate change for social and political unrest in different regions of the world. So uh, it would be very interesting to hear more about this and also about um, the, the the difference between Anthropocene and uh, Capitalocene that is uh, also something he worked on. Um, so Christian, 
Okay, you. thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for that presentation, Andrea. That was really informative. Um, you can hear yes. everything fine at that end? Yes, okay. perfectly. Thanks. So, um, I, I wasn't going to talk about Tropic of Chaos and the way that climate is a, a driver of violence. I mean, suffice it to say that it never, climate is never, climate change is never a driver of violence in isolation. It always drives violence by interacting with the legacy of Cold War and now War on Terror militarism, which has littered much of the global south with cheap weapons, and by interacting with the other pre-existing crisis of neoliberal economic restructuring, which has reduced the state and much of the global south, south to a, um, a mere shadow of its former self, so that when the extreme weather of climate change sets in, it interacts with uh, an emaciated and very often kind of repressive neoliberal state in a landscape littered with guns and people who know how to use them, and there's, there's no possibility for, for society, the economy, or the state to adapt or mitigate. And so patterns of violence reemerge. Uh, that's the thesis of that older book in a nutshell. But what I want to talk about today was kind of um, questions that come up a lot when discussing climate change and the Green New Deal. And at heart of this is this question of, is capitalism sustainable? This is something that people always come back to. And I think the answer is very clearly, no, it's not. Does that mean that uh, the solution to climate change is socialism? Well, maybe, um, or yes, but it's not that simple. We can't just invoke socialism. And I've been kind of troubled by the, the amount that I see people invoking a new society or socialism. Like when, when the eco-socialism comes, everything will be dealt with. And I think that's kind of unrealistic because the fact of the matter is that capitalism leaves a, a technological inheritance to socialism. And we have seen this in the distorted and actually, you know, the, say what you will about them, actually existing socialist experiments that have happened over the last century or so, right? I mean, the Soviet Union, I think to some extent, doesn't get much attention because there's a kind of left critique of it, kind of left anti-communist critique of it that's based in very legitimate concerns about, you know, um, the, the, uh, the repression in the Soviet Union, but that, that we kind of then don't think about other aspects of what the Soviets were struggling with. And if, if we take it a little more seriously, look at how hard it was for the Soviets to get off oil. They couldn't, right? Or Venezuela, right? Venezuela has tried to deal with oil. They cannot get off oil. They cannot break the addiction to oil. Evo Morales and his government in Bolivia, they find themselves similarly, you know, structurally bound to selling natural gas. So capitalist society leaves for socialist experiments a technological inheritance. And what socialists, I think, need to do in part is take responsibility for that. We have to engage a kind of, um, you know, radical politics of reform that, that try and move this society and these institutions towards decarbonization and all the while develop greater class consciousness and political capacity. But it's not sufficient to just think that once there's some sort of radical transformation, then the problem of decarbonization will be dealt with. Uh, the track record of, of socialist experiments does not show that that's, that's necessarily the case. Um, you know, and that is partly because socialization of the ownership of the means of production or the collectivization of it does not uh, automatically translate into decarbonization. So decarbonization is its own thing, and we have to start pushing for it now under these conditions. Um, in terms of thinking about a kind of radical politics of reform in relationship to climate change, I often start with an acknowledgement that the state, contrary to what the intellectuals that support this system say, the state is in fact coming back and the crisis of climate change uh, calls forth the state. I, I had something of an epiphany around this point as a reporter in New Orleans, and I saw that all of these uh, local towns and counties in the South had responded to the crisis in New Orleans by sending whatever resources they had. And after 30 years of the war on drugs, the only resources that most of these towns had were SWAT teams, uh, federally subsidized armored personnel carriers, Heckler and Koch assault rifles, these are like elite German-made rifles that SWAT teams used. And 
they, they sent, all these towns sent this kind of repressive apparatus, not because they thought that the problem in New Orleans was uh, required this kind of repression. Actually, they were smart enough to realize that wasn't the case. And when you actually walked around New Orleans a few days after the storm, there were all these SWAT teams with nothing to do. And the guys actually kind of felt bad about it. And I would ask them, I said, well, you guys, do you have uh, chainsaws? Do you have uh, rubber rafts so you can go rescue people? Like, no, we like, you know, we got one, one chainsaw someone brought from home. We're like, you know, we bought a Zodiac along the way. Like, we have, all we have is this other stuff. So the state comes back when a city is flooded, uh, when tornadoes wipe out hundreds of homes, right? People don't turn to charity. I mean, the charitable organizations play some role. But the, the scale of the disruptions that climate change promises and is already bringing are such that only government has the capacity to respond. And so how, if it responds, I do not think is in question, but how it responds is very much the question. Will it be, will the state that is summoned back be a repressive state or will it be a redistributive state? And so a radical politics of reform is very much about that, shaping the kind of state that will respond to extreme weather and dislocations. And that is part of how states are formed. States are born and, and continually redeveloped through crises like war and natural disaster. And in the United States, we actually have a very long history of the federal government goes back to the very beginnings of the country, the federal government uh, committing itself to making the victims of natural disasters whole. And this is you know, despite the fact that we have a, a Protestant ideology of hating the poor in this country, but people who are impoverished by fires and floods, etc., cetera, um, have a long history of being made whole by the federal government, I given lots of um, economic support. So, I mean, all that brings to, brings to mind Polanyi's, Carl Polanyi's line about how laissez-faire is planned and planning is not. Planning is spontaneous. When crisis happens, that's when all the free market ideology goes out the window and the actual necessity of planning uh, comes back. And that is very much the case with climate change. In terms of um, the role of the state as regards to the New Deal, the Green New Deal, um, you know, the, the key terms in the climate debate, as I'm sure most people know, are mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation involves getting off of fossil fuels and building out a clean energy sector. Adaptation involves adapting physically and socially to the changes that are underway, such as the like, you know, guaranteed three foot minimum sea level rise on um, US Atlantic coastlines. So in terms of mitigation, if we're to think about this, um, this kind of relates to a book that's coming out in less than a year, my next book called The Means Proper, Alexander Hamilton on the State and Economic Development. And it's, it's an economic history of industrialization and the role of the developmental estate in the United States, which is very, you know, has been from the beginning a robust developmental estate that we as a society remain kind of um, in denial about. But if we were to think about getting off of fossil fuels as a form of reindustrialization, we could do worse than look at our own history to see how industrialization actually took place the first time around. And what one finds is that there is heavy state involvement in supporting certain types of industries and um, denying support to others. So step one is to become aware of uh, the capacities of the developmental state and make use of them. And so that means you know, cutting all subsidies to fossil fuels, about $9 billion a year, not allowing fossil fuel extraction on public lands, using public procurement. The public sector is about 35% of the US GDP. The post office has, to take just one example, has a fleet of 140,000 vehicles that basically travel 18 miles a day and park in the same place every night. There's no reason that fleet shouldn't be electrified. Same with other government fleets. Um, the federal government has 450, or actually 430,000 office buildings that are mostly uh, very wasteful as regards energy and water. They could all be retrofit. If the public sector, the federal government and large states taking the lead began a process of retrofitting, of uh, sourcing the energy for their buildings from clean energy, transitioning their vehicle fleets to electric that were sourced by renewable energy, that would help bring the costs of clean technology down to the point where the private sector would start taking on these technologies simply for economic reasons. And to some extent, that is happening, but it's not happening as robustly as it could or should, in part because environmentalists in the U.S., 
have a kind of state aphasia. There, there's, you know, some, one thing that neoliberalism has done is sort of disappeared the state for many people. And I think that's also just, it plays into a kind of an American fantasy about rugged individuals and a denial about the collective nature of our social life and uh, of the very central role of the state within that. So, so there's, I mean, that, the, these, these kinds of, um, you know, radically um, reformist politics, I think, could really do a lot to uh, pull us back from the brink of climate catastrophe. To, to deal with climate change, I think this is also an important point. To deal with climate change is not the same as creating a sustainable society. If capitalism were, if, if social movements could use the state to force capital to abandon fossil fuels and build out a clean energy sector, which would be an enormous feat, that in of itself wouldn't actually lead to a sustainable society. We have all these other problems of increasing toxicity in the environment, ocean acidification, overfishing, deforestation, etc. But climate change is the most urgent and most pressing of these, of these problems, and it's the one we have to deal with first so as to buy time to, to deal with the others. And finally, just one more point on the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal should not be seen as a welfare program that the government has to pay for. That is not the case. It is, it is an agenda for industrial planning. And when people ask the question, it's one of the favorite uh, responses of the critics, who will pay for this? I think the answer should be the energy fund. All the money that currently goes into building energy will pay for it, right? When the rules are changed when the subsidies are cut off to fossil fuels and increased for clean energy, when access to public lands uh, is cut off to drilling and mining, then you'll see all sorts of money flowing into building out clean energy. And there is in fact enormous amounts of money, right? This is the perennial problem for capital. Not that it has too little money, but that it has too much and it runs out of profitable uh, sites of investment and there's over accumulation. Just a measure of that over accumulation Non-financial firms in the United States sit on more than $4.5 trillion of uninvested cash. These are, these are non-financial firms with their main line of businesses making things and services um, that are not financial. Yet they sit on $4.5 trillion worth of cash. This is not money given to stockholders as profits or managers as bonuses. This is money retained by the firms for investment and they literally don't know what to invest in. They're, they're like, you know, Kurtz at the end of the river begging to be put out of their misery or given some direction. So if government were nudging the economy in the direction of the Green New Deal, where would the money come from? It would come from all these places, right? It would come from this hoard, this vast hoard that non-financial firms are sitting on, which is equal to one quarter of the annual GDP of the U.S. And it would come from government procurement, and it would come from all over the economy. So those are my comments. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kristin. This was uh, very important points and also um, very little discussed, especially the, the last point. Um, so we will go back to this, uh, but for the moment, uh, Bryce, do you want to uh, do your opening remarks? Um, tell us a little bit about um, the, the Green New Deal, what the DiEM25 is doing in Europe, and how it's the transnational uh, organization is going. Yes, hello. I'm, I'm very honored to be part of this panel and very humbled. Um, so, uh, what about the Green New Deal in Europe? Um, well, um, I guess first off, you've got to um, define what the Green New Deal is. Um, I totally agree that um, Green New Deal shouldn't be only a question of money. Of course, it's a question of money, but um, it's also a question of redefining uh, the society in which we live. So it's redefining the uh, norms and values of the society and uh, strengthening and deepening democracy as well. Uh, for anyone who has been active in um, the climate movement, it's really uh, obvious that without strengthening democracy and social progress, um, there can be no ecological progress. 
So it's a, it's a complete system change. In Europe, the Green New Deal that M25 is defending is based on the uh, monetary policy of the European Central Bank. As you may know, the European Central Bank creates every month billions of euros. And uh, these billions of euros uh, are entirely, um, entirely uh, targeted at the private sector. And uh, they end up and most of them stay in the, the finance sector. So it's speculative some funds after speculative funds and uh, they never actually serve any proper purpose or useful purpose. Uh, what we say with GM25 is that the European Central Bank, rather than funding uh, this, um, these private banks, should uh, fund uh, a, a, a climate bank like the European Investment Bank, which already exists. Uh, so the the European Central Bank could uh, use its monetary tool to fund um, the European Investment Bank, which would then uh, share this money through the European Union uh, for the necessary investment uh, for climate transition. It could also buy uh, green bonds from the states. I mean, not directly buy them. It's a it's a bit technical. Uh, it would guarantee these bonds that would then be bought by private banks. Uh, but it would still be a use of the monetary creation tools of the European Central Bank. All of these things, and it's very important in the context of the European Union, all of these things are legal because the European Union is quite often stuck uh, by its uh, organizing treaties. And uh, more than anything, we are uh, blocked by the order liberal uh, establishment, uh, which thinks that, uh, well, we should uh, all uh, deal with this problem on our own, and uh, we just have to take shorter showers and eat less meat and uh, not use our cars, even though you might really, really, really need it because you don't have public transportation. And yeah, so you know the picture of putting all the pressure on the shoulder of the individual. Uh, and this, uh, this auto liberal establishment is actually the only obstacle we have in front of us because we have no legal obstacle in front of us. It's only a political one. But this is what we are facing in Europe. Um, the topic of the Green New Deal um, is now entering the public debate, it's not as um, popular as in the United States at the moment, but because we don't have, for the moment, and this is what we are really hoping for, we don't have strong voices in the European Parliament to give strong speeches uh, that would allow us to popular to make it a popular opinion and a popular um, exit uh, of the crisis we are in. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's, uh, I think, as far as I can go for the statement on the Green New Deal uh, in Europe. Okay. Thank you, Bryce. No uh, worries. If you have any questions, because, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the first time I do this. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. We're uh, looking forward to see you. Um, the Green New Deal in Europe and in the United States, of course. And um, now we have, we're here with us, Professor Harvey. Um, Professor Harvey, would you like to discuss uh, a little bit how we got here, how ne uh, neoliberalism brought us to this point? Is it, is it on? Yeah, it's yeah. on. It's <laughs> okay, on. to this point and how, maybe about how cities, um, are in this uh, fit in this uh, um, uh, global um, climate challenges? Yeah, I I, I really think um, I I assume most people who are here and are listening to this know a great deal about uh, the the facts of climate change and the issues uh, which are cropping up in terms of the loss of biodiversity, loss of species, and all that. Um, and I wanted to pay some attention to the question of uh, 
why this might be happening, uh, because I think that plays a very crucial role in determining what it is that we might be able uh, to do about it. Um, and as I think uh, we've already heard, there are, there are many initiatives around uh, uh, which I would uh, support, but at the same time as I would support them, I might always want to question them in terms of to what degree uh, are we dealing with uh, symptoms and uh, some peripheral aspects of the problem as opposed to uh, going to the heart of the question. Uh, I start off with a, uh, the following observation that uh, in, in 1950, uh, I was 15 years old. And at that time, according to uh, uh, economic uh, calculations, uh, the global economy added up to about $4 trillion of activity. Uh, four trillion uh, at uh, standardized uh, 1990 dollars. So you're looking at four trillion. By the time you get to uh, 2000, uh, which was my formal retirement date, uh, the uh, the global economy uh, was around 40 trillion dollars. Uh, now it's close to $80 trillion, and if I live to be 90, it will be $80 trillion. And if I added another 25 years to that, it will be $160 trillion. What you've got is a, a radical expansion uh, from $4 trillion when I was a kid to $40 trillion, $2,000, $80 trillion. And you can see this is... All you environmentalists will know it as the logistical growth curve. And that is what we're on. And the, one of the big questions arises is why does the kind of society that we constructed uh, insist upon this compound rate of growth at 3% forever? And the answer has to be it's because the city is driven by profit seeking and profit, if all entities make a profit, then there's more at the end of the day than there was at the beginning of the day. The system is therefore based upon expansion. Uh, and uh, Marx, when he talked about this, kind of said, well, it would be nice to analyze an economy as if it's uh, a circle. It's not a circle, it's a spiral. And uh, a spiral is a very good example of what uh, Hegel and others called a bad infinity. That is, it's a kind of infinity that just gets out of, out of control. So this out of control, uh, in infinite uh, accumulation of capital uh, poses problems, as Christian mentioned, for example, that uh, a lot of the time corporations end up with masses amount of cash that they don't know what to do with and where are they going to put it. And it's not only corporations, uh, there are other institutions. Uh, one that I'm particularly sensitive to is uh, my pension fund. But actually, pension funds sit there with vast amounts of money, and they're supposed, for my benefit, to invest them at the highest possible rate of profit. Uh, and if they don't do that, they're not uh, obeying their fiduciary obligation, and I will sue them because they're not actually you know, getting an 8 or 10% rate of return on, uh, on my pension money. Now, of course, every now and again, my pension fund crashes, you know, and then I'm, I, I have a double consciousness. On the one hand, I'm saying, hooray, that's the end of capitalism. And then I'm also saying, oh, my God, what am I going to live on? Uh, well, uh, so, so this is the, the, the part, part of the problem. But the problem goes even further than that. And I, I think I, I want to talk about something which is the, the transformation in scale of the, of the problem. And that tra transformation of 
scale comes about from what I will call an increasing massification of capital. That when capital gets into difficulties, it uh, has a crisis of some kind, and it comes out of a crisis by doing certain things and just finding new ways to expand. Uh, but one of the things that happens is that the scale at which it operates shifts. And this came to me a lot uh, through the sort of studies, my urban studies, when I was kind of looking at the crisis of capital in 1848 and looking at the way in which solutions were devised and one of the solutions which was devised by, was by uh, Napoleon uh, III, who kind of said, well, okay, we'll rebuild Paris. So Haussmann was brought uh, to rebuild Paris. And you go to Paris now, and you can see what he did with building the boulevards and all that kind of thing. And when you look at the scale at which that happened, uh, it, it, you know, from our perspective right now, it, it appears fairly sort of fairly intimate uh, compared to, uh, you know, say what we see in Hudson Yards uh, just over here or what we see in Dubai or Shanghai or whatever. Um, but then uh, later on, uh, in a way, the, the whole kind of houseman solution, which is to rebuild the city, infrastructures and all the rest of it, which produced a great deal of, of employment and, and also absorbed a lot of... Uh, of course, raw materials, the import of bricks and, and mortar and all the rest of it. Um, that, that got repeated after 1945 in this country through, uh, just to attach a name to it, uh, Moses. And, and uh, the reconstruction of the whole metropolitan region of New York uh, and the building of the suburbs and Levittown and all of that kind of thing. And you kind of say, well, actually, what Moses did was what Haussmann did, but it's a different scale. It was the whole metropolitan region. And of course, it wasn't only uh, New York metropolitan region. It was the building of Los Angeles and the building of Chicago and, and uh, you know, Atlanta and all the rest of it. So it was the metropolitan, if you like, reorganization of urbanization. Uh, which was also connected together with the building of the interstate highway system and uh, all the rest of it. So you see uh, a, uh, a sort of repeat of the Houseman performance, and I've always intrigued by it because actually at some point Moses wrote an article about Houseman uh, in 1942 before, you know, and kind of uh, an appreciation of Hausmann, but a critique of Hausmann in the sense of saying, well, he, he, he didn't do it quite right, and so on, and Moses was going to do it uh, in a different way. Um, my, my most recent study has been on uh, the question of urbanization in China. And boy, what a shift of scale that entails. You have to look at the whole nation. And you have to look at an, an enormous uh, transformation of the environment. And if I have a little slide just to give you a sense of what this is about. And I, I like to show this because it, it, it has a, a certain kind of uh, shock value. This, this slide is... Uh, the bottom blue line is the consumption of cement in the United States over the last hundred years. The red bars are the consumption of cement in China. Okay. Now this is what I mean by a transformation of scale and an increasing massification. All right. Um, now I've got to talk in some detail about, about this consumption of cement in China, but I want to preface this by saying this is not an anti-China talk. Uh, it's right, right now, of course, there's a tremendous amount of anti-China talk around. China saved global capitalism from collapse in 2007 and 2008. 
it actually stabilized globalized, global capitalism up until around two, 2015. It's been wobbling kind of recently, and the more it wobbles, uh, the more nervous the financial markets get because uh, China has been the big, big pusher of everything. Now, the interesting thing about this was there was a crisis in 2007, 2008. And if you look at the graph of cement consumption, you would expect under normal conditions that if there's a crisis, there would be a stoppage. There's no stoppage here at all. 2007, 2008, suddenly is the point where it starts to shoot up insanely. Why? China was in a great deal of economic difficulty in 2007, 2008. It relied upon the US co consumer uh, for demand and consumption in the United States crashed in 2007, 2008 with the foreclosure crisis and all the rest of it. Uh, and actually, uh, Chinese exports to the United States were cut in half. A lot of uh, companies in China went bankrupt. Uh, there was likely to be mass unemployment. There was talk at the time, although it's always very difficult with Chinese data to know, that there was talk at the time that China lost something like 30 million jobs. 30 million. I mean, this is what I mean about massification and the scale. To lose 30 million jobs in one year. Now, one thing we do know about the Communist Party in China is that it is scared to death of social unrest. And 30 million people with no work ought to be... So they had to put them to work. A bit like Haussmann did in Paris and, you know, put people to work. Well, okay, we're going to have this massive... Uh, reorganization of consumption away from final consumption and consumer markets in the United States to internal consumption, not final consumption, but what Marx calls productive consumption, which is investment in infrastructures. In 2008, China had zero miles of high-speed rail network. It now has about 20,000 miles. So in 10 years, it produced 20,000 miles of high-speed rail network. So if you go there now, you can get on a high-speed train, get in in Shanghai, and five, six hours later, you're in Beijing. It's actually hard to get flights in China anymore because everybody's doing it on the, whizzing around on these high-speed rail networks. So this was, this was the solution, um, which was to build, build new cities, build new transport networks, build new highways, build new airports, build new container ports, build, build, build. And they had a wonderful way of doing it. Everybody imagines that somehow or other China is a highly centralized economy. It's not. It's incredibly decentralized. Basically, a, me a message went out to every municipality and saying, whatever program, whatever you've got going, build, you know, build, build. And so local initiatives just went through the roof. Now, localities have a hard time raising funds. So they had to create new institutions to raise funds to do the, do, do the building. Uh, th there's incredible internalization of competition in China. Uh, mayors are not elected. Mayors are ap appointed. Uh, they're party appointments. And if you're appointed mayor of a local community, you have about four years to show what you can do. And at the end of four years, there's a spreadsheet of your achievements. And number one on the spreadsheet is how much did you increase the local GDP? How much did you do? So every mayor knows that at the end of four years, they've got to up the GDP, local GDP by as much as they possibly can, and they cut corners, and there's all sorts of corruption that goes on to do this, and probably also a great deal of invention as to something that happens when it doesn't, and so on. So all sorts of things like that, that uh, go on. But at the end of four years, if you come out with a really good sort of report on your spreadsheet and you increase the local GDP, 
uh, you took measures to, to ensure uh, local harmony, which means you know, you've kept struggle to the minimum and they start to add all sorts of other things. If you get a good report, people might say, well, okay, you've been mayor of that small community. Maybe you can be mayor of this bigger community. And if you do the same in the bigger community, then you, know, so you can see exactly how this whole thing is incentivized to, to, to actually produce like crazy and to urbanize like crazy. And this is what this represents. And in 2007, 2008, at the end of that, in 2009, the IMF did a detailed study of what the net job losses were, were through the crisis. And the net job loss in the United States was around 14 million people. China's net job loss was, was about 3 million. So the calculation was, which mean, means if they'd lost 30 million jobs, and there's only 3 million you know, net job loss, then they must have created in one year 27 million jobs. Now, you know, say, I mean, how many jobs do we create? Uh, uh, you know, this country, no, this is, this is nowhere, this is, this is the, we're in an order of magnitude, all right? The order of magnitude, which is way, way, way beyond anything that you can imagine. But that was what stabilized global capitalism. Because as you went crazy like this, building this, you needed what? You needed a lot more cement. So you produce cement. Now, the cement industry produces greenhouse gases directly. It's one of the major contributors to greenhouse gases. It has, if you ever lived near a cement works, and actually I did live near one when I was a kid, it's not very, not very nice. You know, ecologically, it's disaster. And by the way, how much does it contribute to biodiversity to actually cover the country with cement? You know? And what does it do to water quality and water runoff and all kinds of... I mean, you just got to start to think about the consequences of, of, of all of this cement being spread around. But at the same time as China's doing this, it's also... Uh, there's a tremendous demand. It needs steel. It needs copper. It needs raw materials. And, and, and actually, it's very interesting. The economy of Australia went through 2007, 2008 without too much difficulty. Why? Because there was a huge de demand for iron ore, minerals, coal, all the rest of it. And any country that was producing raw materials in that period suddenly found raw material prices rose. Now, this is something that was very weird about the crisis of 2007, 2008. Everything seemed to be crashing except commodity prices seemed to be going up. Well, why? Because the Chinese were going so commodity prices, soybeans, etc. So if you're Brazil and you're providing iron ore to, you know, so the Brazilian economy was fl flourishing pretty well after 2008. I mean, it went through a little dip, but it came out very fast because it's providing iron ore, soybeans to China. And, and, and that was what was stabilizing everything. And, and actually, if you look at global mineral extractions, you see a rapid uptick in global mineral extractions all around the world. Now, where are these minerals being mined? Well, it's all over Africa, it's in Northeast India, it's in Latin America. And if anybody gets in the way of that, they get knocked out very fast. Uh, Ecuador got very integrated into the Chinese kind of circuit and Ecuador does have a lot of, of, of metals, lithium and all that kind of thing, and it happens to, happens to be mined all over the place. And so basically, the Ecuadorian government, which supposedly is good on you know, indigenous rights and all the rest of it, is at the same time turning to the Chinese and say, you want all of those metal minerals in south, southern Ecuador? Uh, go ahead. And if indigenous people get in the way, don't worry, we'll, we'll take care of them. And they did. Well, it's not very nicely either. I mean, you know, several indigenous leaders in the south of Ecuador were killed uh, because of the resistance to the expansion of the mining industry, which had everything to do with, I mean, you just, see, just start to see the connections between all of this. Now, my point here is to kind of say that 
The climate question and the environmental question cannot be divorced and discussed without actually saying to what degree the dynamics of capitalism put us in a situation of this kind where either you're going to have mass unemployment or you're going to have, in the Chinese case, probably a revolution from below because there's no way in which 30 million people, the Chinese, are going to start milling around with, it was bad enough as it was, things got very rough in China in 2007, 2008 with the non-payment of wages and, and all kinds of social unrest, but the, the Chinese managed to finesse it through the use of local power and through the use of uh, all, all of the uh, you know, the expansions that I've been that I've been talking about. So, the increasing massification actually transforms the nature of environmental problems in interesting ways. When I was a kid, fifteen, yeah, there were in environmental problems. Uh, the local gas works, the, the stink that came from that was, you know, there was. But nearly all of the environmental issues were local issues. And local issues could be taken care of in a, in a local kind of way. And you could get local improvements. And actually, one of the best things that happened in, to local uh, environmental conditions uh, in many uh, cities in North America and Europe was deindustrialization. Pittsburgh used to have, you know, it was a pig of a place to be in terms of. Uh, but when, when the steel industry gets destroyed because all the steel production is going to, you know, sort of Asia and elsewhere, uh, air quality is much better. Water quality is much better. So suddenly you find that many areas of, uh, of, 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 of say, North America, uh, water quality and air quality has been significantly improved in certain ways. And, uh, but that's because of deindustrialization. But why did deindustrialization occur? Well, it's because, uh, first off, there were a nature of technological changes which occurred, but also because of offshoring. So you exported lousy air quality. And actually, over the last you know, 10, 15 years, uh, north of the Yangtze River in China, air quality has been so bad that life expectancy has been de decreasing. And, and in fact, uh, you know, China, you know, Beijing had to close down its major airport for about, I don't know, 10 days because of this humongous smog. So air quality in Chinese cities is absolutely disastrous. And this is actually one of the, one of the interesting kind of, kind of things about this environmental problem. You know, Engels once said about the housing question, he said, the, the, you know, the bourgeoisie only has one solution to the housing question, it, it, the housing problem, it moves the problem around. This is what happens often with, with environmental problems. You move them around. And capital is very good at moving you around so you can come up with the illusion that actually things are better in Pittsburgh than they were once. And so, you know, what's all this fuss about, you know, environmental you know. But when you start to look at the aggregate and the scale of the problem, you've got a climate change problem which nobody was aware of in, say, the 1950s and 1960s, but now people are super aware of it. We've discovered certain other things. I mean, who discovered the ozone hole and what to do about it and why did, it, you know, why did we end up with, actually, in this instance, a, f a fairly model international treaty, the Montreal Protocol, which... Uh, why couldn't we do something like that in relationship to you know carbon emissions? You know, and we've been trying. At least there is some trying going on. So the the the, the nature of the problem shifts, but but also it gets moved around, and it gets moved around from one thing, one place to another. Can you ever get rid of pollutants? What to do with? You know, with with pollutants. Well, you either put it in the water and hope it disappears. Or you put it on the land and you clean up the water, or you put it in the air, you know. And you can do something in the air which then actually ends up somewhere else. I mean, the famous example in, 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 in my lifetime uh, was, was the whole kind of qu question of acid deposition and acid rain. Uh, again, as a kid, I happened to pass through London at the height of the Great Smog of 1951, it was, or 52, 52. 
uh, a smog where it was, it was thick yellow sulfur. <laughs> and a lot of people died in that smog. It had everything to do with, with everybody kind of trying to keep warm in a very cold December. Uh, and of course, everybody lit their fires, and their fires were cold fires, and so you get sulfur. And, and so uh, after the London smog, uh, the thing goes out, we're going to get rid of coal fire, you know, heating systems, and everybody's going to go to electricity and this kind of stuff. But they needed the electricity. So suddenly the, the smog starts to disappear because you know, people aren't burning uh, coal anymore, they're using electricity. But the ele where did the electricity came from? It came from, uh, in London's case, came from uh, a Battersea power station. A Battersea power, power station had uh, kind of very tall smokestacks, 200 feet tall. And the idea was that when you got the climatic conditions that gave you a smog, which is a temperature inversion, the draft in these chimneys would throw the stuff up above the, 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 the inversion level and chuck it into the upper atmosphere. And that's what it did. And it solved, it solved everybody's problem in London, at least, you know, the, 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 the only trouble was that once it got up there, everybody f thought it would just dissipate. Except, you know, about 10 years later, the Scandinavians suddenly find they're, 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 all of their lakes are, are getting, dying from uh, excessive uh, acidification. And it's acid deposition. Where is it coming from? Where is this new, you know, well, of course it's coming from Battersea Power Station. So you, you, you regionalize the problem, so you go from a local problem to a regional kind of problem. And now, of course, you've got a global problem. So again, there's a transformation of scale and an increasing massification. And it takes a different politics to deal with that. I mean, when you've got something like the London smog, then everybody knows we've got to do something about this. It becomes more abstract when it's about, you know, my coal power station is chucking stuff up into the atmosphere, which is coming down in Scandinavia and Finland and God knows where else. And anyway, can you really show that that acidification, I mean, Margaret Thatcher, sort of when she was faced with this acidification of, of Scandinavian lakes, kind of said, well, it has something to do with pine needles, which led Ronald Reagan to say, well, it's actually trees that cause pollution. So you get these weird sort of, so, but now, but now we've got a, a, a much more global kind of problem, which is then becomes politically much more difficult to deal with. And, and it's more abstract. And I think that then the question of, of how to formulate the question of the abstractions and to try to bring the abstractions down to the realities, and fortunately, of course, and unfortunately to some degree, people only will actually respond to the abstraction when they have very tangible you know, means. So you start making claims which are not actually reasonable claims, which kind of say that the increased hurricanes and the intensity of... Of, uh, yeah, of, of flooding and things of that kind are actually directly due when, you know, actually the, the causality is much more complicated than that. So we've got a problem right now, which is, which is how, how to deal with the metabolic relation to nature, how to deal with it in a context where economic growth uh, is absolutely a sacrosanct end of every political regime that exists, where would you find a political regime that would kind of say, actually, we embrace the idea of zero growth? You won't find any political regime that's going to do that. You're going to face the fact that everybody is getting around, getting worried about the fact that the growth rate in Europe right now is only you know, 1.2% or something like that. And the growth rate in Japan for 20 years has been 0%. This is, this is, this is unacceptable. So we have, we have the, the dynamics of capital accumulation on the one hand, which are absolutely mandating certain kind of transformations which are occurring both technologically and, uh, and, and, and in terms of of demand and, 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 and lifestyles and, 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 and all the rest of it. And that transformation has everything to do with the 3% compound rate of growth, 
which is which is putting us onto this this trajectory. And if you look at this and you then kind of say, well, okay, this is the condition in 2007, 2008. What happens when the next crisis comes along? Yeah, 25 years from now. What, what kind of graph are we going to be looking at then? How much cement will we have to spread around to do, uh, to do this kind of thing? And, uh, and it, or is there another way out of it other than doing this? The fact is, this was what saved global capitalism from disaster. Mass unemployment, mass uh, you know, constriction of, uh, of economic activity would have been the result of what happened in 2007 2008. But, uh, but it was saved by all of this cement. And then you kind of go, all right, what are we going to do in relationship to that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're running a little late, so I think we are going to open to Q&A and, uh, and try to collect a little bit of, uh, of questions so that we have uh, more of a conversation. <laughs> I, I see hands raised up already. So, um, okay. Um, Aris? Thank you so much for that. Um, that was fantastic. I thought I was in school for a minute and I really got into it. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you and the panel, I spent my first 10 years on the um, continent of West, on the continent of Africa, 10, 13 years, and then the next 10, 13 years in the UK, and then the past 30 years here in the States. Um, I'm wondering why the village way of doing things is sort of never brought up in environmental conversations. And I say this because this is what I see as a bit of a um, path towards a solution. Um, when I say the village way of doing things, I mean the old-fashioned you look at the person in the African village who has 10 children and they're passing on the clothes that the elder wore to the younger to the younger. It's a lot of the very basic primitive way of living. I'm wondering why no one in this current environmental talk mentions Africa and, and maybe looking to the villagers in Africa to teach us how to sort of get back to where we need to go. I'm sorry. Just thought I'd get some thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I think we can collect two, three questions first, and then uh, we can uh, decide. I ask you if you please keep the questions very short, and also for the answers, um, we'll keep it short. Okay. Um, I have a question for uh, Professor Harvey, maybe. Uh, I think my question is about the importance of cement, maybe. Uh, it's a general question about uh, Neil Deals. To what extent does it matter where, you know, the, this uh, excess liquidity is spent on? To what extent does it matter that it's spent in uh, new infrastructure as opposed to just creating a sense of direction and uh, order taming social unrest and uh, just creating jobs. To what extent does it matter in what is a New Deal money spent on? Okay, and uh, if you can also introduce yourself, I think that would be nice. George, my question is uh, GDP, probably for David or anybody else. GDP captures every activity that happens in the economy a lot of it is bad stuff. So it sounds like GDP is the wrong way to even talk about growth when we are capturing crime, fixing the results of crime, disasters, the results of finance, prison, uh, prisoners, all that stuff, I mean, that's where I see the problem. I'd like to see growth in good things, 
and reduction of all the bad things. That I think we can handle without destroying the environment. Okay, so um, regarding the first question on uh, villages and in particular on uh, Africa model, is there anybody who would like to speak on this subject in particular? Yes, Andrea, please. Thank you. Um, I think that the, the, not just Africa, of course, indigenous peoples in Africa are a regional caucus and also will be participating uh, with their own representative on the new um, platform. Uh, what we have the first meeting in Bonn in um, June 14th to 16th of, uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, local communities and indigenous peoples um, platform on traditional knowledge exchange for climate change. But the development, you know, most of the food produced in the world, I'll go back one step to that, according to UN Food and Agriculture Organization, is already produced by small producers. And it's very important to look at that, the relationship, as I talked about, between original local traditional food and ability for adaptation to climate change. And as we were talking, my husband brought in a good example. I'll hold it up. This is him. He was in my PowerPoint also, um, showing about the traditional knowledge about protection of the plants. Um, this is um, his harvest from today on nopales. I'm not sure how many people know what that is. It's a kind of cactus, but it's very, very good food. Um, it also is uh, a local um, product and it adapts very well to the changing weather conditions that we're already seeing in the desert, not just in the um, the Arctic and the Pacific, our indigenous peoples um, seeing major changes, but in the desert, uh, which is where we live, um, the Sonora Desert, which spans Arizona and also um, Northern Mexico. So I just wanted to bring this up that everybody really needs to look at local food production, not only because it addresses um, in a positive way, you know, the, the need for more and more highways and concrete and cement and uh, trucks, et cetera, because you're producing locally, but because uh, local foods, especially when they're grown by the indigenous and local peoples, um, know themselves how to adapt um, to the changing weather conditions. So I just wanted to show this, I introduced the farmer. I don't know how many people out there produced anything um, from your own garden, it could be a patio garden or, you know, a porch garden, but your own garden to eat today because you really do need to start thinking about that as we talk about uh, responding to climate change. Here's the nopales. Here's the farmer mm -hmm. in Valencia. Hi. Um, and this was produced right outside, our, right outside here on our land today uh, and harvested today. So, um, I just wanted to respond with that, but it's the case in Africa and many different places around the world where there are indigenous peoples and local communities producing food. We need to go back to that system for lots of reasons. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, Professor Harvey, you want to answer the questions about the cement and uh, GDP? Um, yeah, I agree with you. There's a um, there was a movement some time ago by Kenneth Boulding to suggest that we should have a measure of gross domestic bads as well as gross domestic goods. Um, and that if we started to put in the bads, and this is done, in, um, ecological accounting sometimes tries to uh, come up with these uh, different different measures. The the problem, however, is that, that um, the, you know, the the main institutions of global capitalism have their own measures and you've got to deal with the World Bank and the IMF and the Bank of International Settlements and these are the sorts of organizations that are actually determinative for a lot of the language and data collection that we reutilize and, and of course that data then becomes the basis of, uh, of a lot of speculative activity and markets and so on. So that's the, that's the difficulty with that. I mean, I agree with you entirely. We need completely different accounting accounting systems for to, for really thinking uh, this this through and and a lot of that needs then to capture some of the possibilities that exist at these other levels which could exist in you know village economies or could live exist 
in World War II in Britain, for example, there was this dig for victory campaign where everybody was uh, you know, encouraged to go out and create their own food supply and, and actually about 14%, 15% uh, of uh, the food supply of Britain came from people's back gardens at that, at that time during, during wartime. But then you come into this other kind of, kind of problem about uh, you know, these village economies or uh, anything else. I, if, if, if you ask somebody, f and, I, and I ask this directly of, uh, of some uh, chi Chinese peasants, would you want to go back to living the life or do you want to what you got now? And the answer was, I want what I got now. There's no way I, I would want to go back to live uh, the life of a villager in Africa or, uh, you know, I don't think that people would would, would ever would ever want would ever want to do that. I mean, I think one of the reasons we don't discuss those economies as much as we should has a lot to do with the fact that even in indigenous groups, I mean, if you look at an organization like the Mapuche Indian group in southern Chile, a large segment of the Mapuche are now urbanized and don't want <laughs> Uh, to go back to an indigenous way of life, even though there are certain aspects of their culture that they want to hang on to. So there's a very complicated sort of uh, question there. Now there are some who do, so you get some divisions within an indigenous movement in terms of uh, what, what the aspirations uh, are. And, and uh, then there's the kind of, kind of question of, broader kind of question of why does the surplus have to be spent on cement as opposed to doing something else? And the answer to that has to do with, at the end of the day, the surplus has to be spent in such a way that it actually generates something called a profit. Uh, and that's hard, hard to do. And in order to, to, to there be a profit, there has to be some Im impact on productivity. Uh, now, the interstate highway system in the United States clearly affected productivity and therefore it was a positive kind of thing and therefore would be paid for. Uh, whereas if you had investment that, uh, that is just white elephants, if, as we call it, in, in, in the built environment, and that does happen, then they're not paid for, and, 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 then, the, and then the money is effectively lost, the value is lost. So the problem is, yeah, if, if it was just a matter of taking resources and allocating them anywhere, or we're not concerned with any kind of profitability at the end of the day. The trouble is, within a capitalist economy, it has to, at some point or other, find a way of earning that 5 or 7 or 8%. Otherwise, you know, my pension fund is not going to grow. And I want my pension fund to grow, God damn it, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> you see, see, see the difficulty. I mean, uh, this is, uh, and there's, there's some weird stories about pension funds, and by the way, pension funds are involved in land grabbing in Africa, so that actually they're taking over lands in Africa at very, very rapid rates uh, right, right now. And again, this is another dimension to the environmental kind of question. Thank you. Um, and I uh, would like to ask a question to Briss. Um, so I know that there are many, um, many activities and uh, the movement is doing uh, different things. There are different coordinated actions um, regarding climate change. So I would like to hear a little bit more about this. What are the actions and what are you uh, trying to do? And, um, and then I would like also to um, go back to what uh, Christian um, Parenti was saying on um, the role of the, the state and how we should uh, strengthen the role of the state and maybe also change um, the way uh, the local communities see the state. So um, I would like to understand better both the relationship between local communities and state, but also among different states, if like the, the solution must be found at the multilateral level or like how can we um, create this kind of cooperation? Um, Briss, you want to start? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me start with something very simple. Um, we need a new international. Uh, I think it would be, it would have been completely impossible for the workers' movement in the 20th and uh, late, uh, late 19th century to uh, achieve uh, any results 
uh, without uh, the presence of the first, second, and third international. Now, that being said, something very interesting is uh, going on at the moment uh, with uh, the movement of the climate strikes. Uh, young people are uh, coordinating their efforts all over the globe, mainly, uh, mainly in Europe, uh, to go on strike and have the same demands. Uh, and this is something very, very interesting to, uh, to witness. Um, I myself have been part of this movement uh, uh, since the month of October, and we started working on the global, the first global strike for climate that was on the 15th of March. We started working on this uh, in November. And, uh, and we have some very positive results, uh, like uh, outside of Europe from uh, India, from uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and Canada. Uh, but uh, strangely enough, or maybe not, um, we, we do not have strong ties yet. Uh, we, we are starting to have ties. But we do not have strong ties for example, with the United States. Um, and this is something that uh, would be very interesting um, if we were able to strengthen the ties, for example, uh, with the Sunrise Movement in the United States. Uh, because um, here in Europe, for example, the videos from Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez are widely spread within the climate movement. But we are not sure, tell me if, if I'm wrong, but we are not sure that actually the videos of uh, the hundreds of thousands of people, uh, actually it was 1.2 million people in Europe um, uh, in March, uh, demonstrating uh, across the continents are shared in the United States. Uh, and this is at the moment, I think, uh, a real source of hope because um, there is a whole generation of people uh, understanding that in order to uh, achieve uh, ecological transition, social progress, and democratic progress, uh, we have to expand our, um, our sense of citizenship, as, uh, of uh, demos, as, uh, from the Greek sense of the term. And this is what is going on at the moment um, from the activist uh, point of view. Uh, something very, very uh, interesting and powerful to witness, uh, which still lacks uh, some um, geographical um, ties, for example, with the United States, but also some uh, social ties. It's mainly a student strike so far. And we have trouble. Um, talking to the workers. We know for sure that the moment we get the workers to do a, a general strike across borders, such as we were able to get the students to go a general strike across borders, then the political establishment will start to move. And uh, this is where we are at, at the moment, and this is where we are stuck. And we are still looking for solution to um, go above this glass ceiling. But it's a, the most interesting development uh, I can see at the moment, including uh, mass civil disobedience movements such as Extinction Rebellion, which are uh, entirely part of this movement as they open new ways with their radical methods. Thank you. Um, and uh, Christian, do you want to talk about? Yes. Um, so in terms of, you know, I mean, climate change brings back the state because it creates these emergencies and disasters, and that's when the state returns. So the question is, what form does that state have when it returns? You could look at Trump's border militarization, right, which is nothing new. I mean, that, the, the U.S. border has been steadily militarized since the early 90s, and Clinton presided over a lot of the wall building and a lot of the militarization of the border. But, but you could look at uh, the crisis on the border right now, which is after uh, several years of net 
out migration back to Latin America from the U.S., there is, in fact, a wave of climate refugees, basically coming from Central America where there's been drought for four years, and there's a, a rust attacking coffee, a rust that, that likes dry, hot weather. And so there's, you know, uh, lots of people moving to the U.S. border. And the Trump response is further militarization of the border. So, you know, the state comes back and the question is, well, are we going to, as movements, try and shape how the state responds to disaster? I think it's going to become a, a, a much bigger part of politics. Um, and I just saw the other night somewhere a National Guard ad that was, for the first time I'd ever seen it, was like a climate-themed National Guard ad. It was clearly filmed in, you know, like some replica of the California fires. Um, so that's why the state is important, right? because, it, because it steps in. And so I think part of the, the task of movements is to build up the state capacities that have been attacked under neoliberalism, right? Um, the, the uh, social welfare functions of the state, the planning functions of the state, but also a kind of, you know, civil defense. And um, part of the problem in the U.S. is that we're only now beginning to come out from a, a, a period of, a long period of people on the left being very phobic about speaking about government. This is something that's just really inherent in U.S. culture. And so even as people can invoke socialism, they get uncomfortable with thinking about, wait, well, what are we actually talking about there? You know, well, what role does state power play in all this? But I think the Bernie Sanders campaign and Ocasio-Cortez's election, all this is breaking down a kind of movement versus government or electoral politics division. And, and we're having, as illustrated by the example that Bryce brought up of Ocasio-Cortez standing there among the protesters, right? The elected official and the protest movement operating together. Um, and that's, that's the hope I see for reforming and transforming the state amidst this crisis. In terms of multilateral politics, I mean, that's important. The uh, technology transfers from north to south, capital transfers, that's all important. But multilateral politics are hostage to the politics of powerful states. And I don't put a lot of faith in those multilateral, uh, the COP process or any of these other agreements. Uh, I think more important is actually the decisions that are made in China. What's going on all over the world, there's you know, a billion people who don't have electricity and are gonna get it in the next you know, 15 years all across the global south. And the key question in reality, not that it should be this, but the, the key question is, you know, are these cheap, Chinese solar panels competitive with the diesel generator that we could buy, you know, and, you know, right now in the end of some river somewhere, somebody with a bar or a clinic, whatever, is deciding what technology to use based not on concerns about climate change, but on, on the price point of this technology. And I think actually more important than any multilateral agreement is how much China and other states can use industrial policy to achieve economies of scale that bring clean technology down to the point where it is out competing fossil fuel technology. Now that said, I'm all, I'm all in favor of multilateral agreements, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't put too much stock in their capacity to transform the behavior of at least powerful states. And when powerful states invest in clean technology, the price goes down. And when they don't, when they make war on clean technology, as essentially the Trump administration is doing, then that is absolutely uh, negative. Thank you. Yes. Um, do we have other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you to each of you. I mean, thank you, Constanza, for moderating. So, um, try. Okay, I'm going to. Um, my question is to each of the panelists, and I am going to ask the question, but then very briefly just specify where my question is coming from. And my question is. Um, how do you see the role that the role of images in regard to all this failed policy that we have around um, the climate emergency? And I'm approaching that question from um, how images have been used as evidence and even been required for, for a lot of US policy. So for example, even with the Parks Department, the reason why we have uh, robust protections for park departments in the US is because of at the 1870s, here in the US, photographs were widely circulated by William Jackson that showed, oh, the natural world is this beauty that humans have a duty to protect. And then we have policy based on that. 
um, also with even the New Deal, right? The, F, uh, the FDR administration here, all these uh, very problematic photographs were used as evidence to establish policy. So my question is about that. Like, where do you see the role of images um, failing, you know, in establishing policy that would actually um, enable us to respond with much more efficiency or with a matching level of emergency to, to the climate um, crisis? Uh, my name is Max. I, I wrote my master's dissertation on uh, Chinese socialism and uh, its impact on Venezuela. That was back in 2009, so things have since changed. But I know that in terms of food security, uh, China, I forgot which other countries, they bought a significant percentage of Uruguay just so they would have food security outside of their own country because of industrialization. And that kind of piggybacks on her comment about <clears throat> excuse me, about indigenous communities and kind of um, replicating the way things used to be. I know that they really don't want that um, over there for the most part because they see what other people have and they want it. And I worked at a consulting firm and our main clients were uh, Saudi Arabia sovereign and sovereign wealth fund and Bahrain sovereign wealth fund. And I know that all of the initiatives they had in uh, the developing world were simply extracting every possible resource that they could the same thing happened um, in Argentina. We did a business forum down there. And it's just interesting because none of the initiatives really are focused on anything but extracting resources from the developing world and um, make money off of it. So, so the first question is um, for everybody on the panel. Um, so does anybody want to start in particular? on images, Andrea? Andrea Andrea's raising her hand, but I don't think, you, you gotta unmute your mic, Andrea. <laughs> I did, I just, I just unmuted, yes I did. Um, the International Treaty Council, um, I didn't say much about it, we were founded in 1974 and uh, have, we're actually a membership organization uh, from, in, from indigenous peoples from um, Arctic Village in Vinatai in the Arctic in uh, Alaska, all the way down, all the through to Argentina, out to the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean Islands. Uh, we have many, many affiliates um, of indigenous peoples. And if you read the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the right to traditional economies, as well as the right to participate in um, more, you could say, modern economies are, are both there. Um, the right to have access to health care of the state is there, as well as to, to maintain traditional health practices. Um, that belong to the indigenous peoples themselves based on um, natural remedies, etc. They're both there. This is the collective voice of indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, we really don't um, ascribe to what we feel is a false dichotomy between being able to be part of um, sustainable development in the modern world and maintain our traditional practices and traditional foods. And in fact, you know, we're looking at prophecies um, of our ancestors about this time, and they are telling us we must maintain those things. Uh, and now the global community um, through the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is asking us to share those things as uh, maybe their best hope of um, ability to uh, adapt and mitigate climate change. Um, there, there, it, I guess, um, was an adequate time to talk about how the relationship to our traditional original systems is in so many examples I could provide our identity, our culture, our well being. Um, our way to prevent uh, diabetes, you know, all of the different things that we're seeing that are affecting us. And indigenous peoples are not willing and not ready in any place. And I mean the indigenous peoples we work with that are members of Treaty Council, like Konai, 
the Confederation of Indigenous Peoples and Nations of Ecuador, the national indigenous organization, never, and they participated in all of our food sovereignty activities. We talk about food sovereignty, not food security, or food sovereignty as prerequisite uh, for food security. Have ever talked about um, having a willingness to give up our identity and our traditional natural relationships to our, our foods, our clan systems, our ceremonies, which depend on those foods and also provide um, life and sustenance to those foods. I'm thinking our own ceremony, the Yaki Deer Dance. Um, those cyclical relationships um, are not on the um, auction block in exchange for having electricity in our homes. So I think, you know, somehow how there's like a false distinction that nobody can go back. We know that no one goes back, but we can maintain our own identity and who we are in the world while we help the world to go forward in a sustainable way. Um, as well as, you know, to preserve our own identity. Uh, part of the problem is, you know, our land rights, our water rights um, are not respected. Uh, as people refer to, there's imposed development uh, in our, our natural um, habitats where we always depended on for our food, our food security, our food sovereignty. Um, our traditional seeds have been uh, patented and genetically modified by Monsanto, you know, lessening our ability to adapt. And we're still, you know, fighting every day, uh, impose fossil fuel development on our territories, coal, oil, fracking, etc. So I, I know I, I don't want to go on and on with this, but I feel like somehow we've fallen into a um, unreal distinction um, between science and traditional knowledge, um, between um, being part of of sustainable development and keeping our traditions. And I have to say that indigenous peoples around the world reject that false uh, dichotomy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, is, uh, is anything, um, Briss or Christian, do you want to add on uh, this? I mean, in terms of in terms of, you know, village knowledge and traditional knowledge, I mean, there's no shortage of good examples of how human beings can interact with their environment, right? The question is what forces are opposing those and why are they not being scaled up? And, you know, they're being opposed first and foremost by the fossil fuel industry, but more broadly by the organized right, right? And its ideology of laissez-faire uberalis and um, you're trying to erase any notion of there being a collective life and trying to portray government, which is the institution, the modern institution by which society comes together and can control powerful private interests. And I mean, when I hear about these, you know, it's, and I think about all the, all the kinds of technologies that, that are old and those that are new that could be used, that, you know, that's what comes to mind. Well, I mean, who's opposing this and how do we oppose them? And I think there, that it, you know, as intellectuals and activists, there's different ways of doing things. But I mean, clearly, part of the, the the front has to be this battle of ideas around what what is the real nature of capitalism. And part of the myth is that capital just operates autonomously from government, from the state, and that the state imposes itself on capital. And that is, I think, fundamentally not the case. That historically, you see that. The state and capital have collaborated wherever capital has, um, you know, led development. And so part of what we have to do is, is push back against individualism and this kind of reification of the market as a naturally occurring thing. No, it's, it's an artificial thing that governments produce and reproduce. That's what Professor Harvey was describing, right? A powerful state saving global capitalism. Um, and the U.S. also played a huge role in that, right? Uh, the, the stimulus under Obama was the single largest stimulus ever passed in the United States. The New Deal had more um, overall, but, but no single stimulus that equaled that portion of, of GDP. So that's what I would say in terms of, um, you know, traditional knowledge. Okay, thank you. And uh, regarding the question about uh, China that uh, Max 
was, uh, was making, Professor Harvey, maybe you want to add something about this? Um, <clears throat> well, the China, part, part of the, the problem with talking about China is that you're almost always out of date by the time you get around to writing it down. Um, and um, I, I, I mean, and things are moving very fast, it seems to me, in terms of China's positionality in relationship to many of these questions. Uh, they've clearly acknowledged uh, now uh, that the environmental question is one of the big questions. They've, they still have in their official documentation the idea they're going to be a fully socialist society by 2050. And by a fully socialist, they mean that they gonna, well, there's going to be some harmony in terms of the metabolic relation to nature, and that's one of their commitments. And I have to say, when the Chinese make commitments, they, they tend to go ahead and do it. They're not very democratic about it, and we can regret uh, a lot of that. But, uh, but uh, so, so it, it, you know, there, there could be a real, a real uh, uh, shift. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, food sovereignty, I mean, China does have a problem of, I don't know, about, what is it, 40% of the world's population and only 10% of the world's arable land or something like that, which said, suggests that there's, there's, there's going to be a food supply problem in, in, in China, uh, which leads into the acquisition of uh, land rights in Africa. Uh, the penetration of uh, many parts of uh, Latin America uh, by by Chinese uh, capital ind indirectly because you know foreign ownership of land is kind of problematic in Latin America much of Latin America so so what you know exactly where China might go is it seems to me to be a, a, a bit of a an open question, and of course, China is under assault right now by the by the Trump administration, uh, which may actually play into China's hands in the sense that uh, there's there's two two things the Trump administration is on about. One is intellectual property rights. My own view of this, which is, is absolutely critical to this, is that, that this intellectual property rights is, is, uh, is an enclosure of what's, what should be in the commons. And that the free transfer of all technological information and ideas and possibilities should be one of the principles of global trade when right now uh, we're seeing protectionism of intellectual property rights and the extraction of rents from intellectual property rights on the behalf uh, of the United States and some of the advanced capitalist countries. Uh, so, but this is, this is again part of the law right now that China does not play by the rules because it doesn't actually acknowledge intellectual property rights. Well, I think that's a great thing. Uh, and actually, if you look backwards, the United States never acknowledged intellectual property rights back in the 19th century. And by the way, it stole a lot of intellectual pro you know, property after World War II and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, it stole all of the, the scientists from, I mean, you know, come on. Uh, so so I, think, I think that, that, that and this is something that I think the Chinese could really take a lead on. Uh, and and to the degree that uh, you know technology is as, as Christian mentioned also about the solar panels and all the rest of it to the degree that there is there is a role to be played here it could be that China could take that path but one of the difficulties in China is the problem of the relationship between the state and labor the labor issue in China uh, the way I would put it is that in China you've got a, a class in itself uh, which has formed and is now fully formed, it is not yet a class for itself in the sense that it's going to actually exercise. And to the degree it's trying to become a class for itself, it seems to be running up against the fact that this is a challenge to the power of the party, and so there's going to be a kind of uh, a clash of, of, of some kind. Uh, internationally, I think that there's going to be a very interesting phase coming up to the degree that the United States keeps using sanctions to smash as much as it can. At some point or other, I think you're going to see a coalition 
which is beginning to emerge between Russia and, and China and elsewhere, and saying, we want part of the world which is sanction-free. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to be in a situation where we're constantly being subjected to, to, to some sort of set of sanctions arbitrarily by the United States because... So I think actually a lot of what Trump is doing is likely to produce a backlash of a certain kind in which we may end up with free technology, no more of this business of using the almighty dollar as a means to, to crush uh, whoever you want, wherever you want. Uh, and and I, so I think that, 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 that what we, we sort of see right now of, of both China and Russia supporting Venezuela and the fact that the coup did not go along as it was expected to go along by the United States, there's this, this stuff going on here that is kind of really rather, uh, rather, ra rather interesting. But uh, I don't, I don't count China out as a progressive force. I really don't. Uh, at the same time, as I'm not going to say it's, oh, oh yeah, no, it's it's the greatest socialist thing that's ever come down the pike. No, it's not. But it, it's it, it's it's a different. Uh, kind of kind of world, and, and to the degree that it is now, I think, partly for again internal reasons, taking the environmental and question seriously, and beginning to even exercise some leadership in relationship to global environmental change. I think this is important. Um, but just on the question on the image, I always think when when we got that picture of Earth rise, it changed it changed people's way of looking at the Earth. And I think we've never been able to you know, go back. Uh, and that, that notion that, yeah, we are a globe. You know? And you could see it from the outside, and it was colored blue, and all kinds of things like that. I think this is a, so the image is very important. But the trouble is, of course, images can be used. So there's a, a struggle within the realm of image construction. And I think that's where we're at. Thank you. Um, and sadly, we are going to start to wrap up because uh, we are uh, already out of time. But I wanted to ask uh, for um, uh, the, our panelists if they have something else that they would like to add, especially regarding solution-oriented, um, uh, what, what we can do in the future, what uh, solutions we can have, and how to go forward. And I ask you to please stay around one or two minutes max, because we, we don't have much time. Um, Brace, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the only thing I would like to share, um, what can we do? Get in the fight. Uh, I don't know how many people there are uh, in, this, uh, in this venue, and, but get in the fight. Uh, uh, lowering your uh, personal carbon footprint, it's good. It's good that you do this, but it's never going to be enough. Get in the fight. This is a, a philosophical fight above all things. Uh, fight against the idea uh, that only individual things matter, only individual efforts matters, and this is a free fight for all, one against the other. Fight against this. And change your mindset. The moment you are more afraid of climate change than you are afraid of going in an unauthorized, climate strike, this is the moment you are actually becoming a threat uh, to the power, uh, to the establishment in power. Um, I think that's all I can and have to share for now. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. Um, Andrea, do you want to add something? Um, yes, I, I agree um, with the previous speaker about um, starting by understanding the seriousness of what we're faced with. Um, li literally, what will become in the future may be a life and death struggle, definitely already for a lot of species. And it could come to that, according to our prophecies, for human beings as well. And I hate to think we're like the, you know, frog... Um, in the, in the cold pot of water that's being slowly heated and we just aren't noticing 
um, the changes that we're already seeing. So uh, our, our Indigenous people's um, prophecies and stories talk about some very, very serious things. And sometimes we say we shouldn't even share them um, because it'll make people feel, oh, what's the use, you know? I mean, maybe too late already or something. We don't feel like that. We have a responsibility to do everything that we can. And we're very aware that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will look back on today, right now, every single person listening and will say, you knew what was happening. What did you do? What did you, you actually do? So it's a very personal um, as well as a global issue for us. And Indigenous peoples don't separate humans from the environment. We, we don't even have words that, that describe that. So um, I, I just want to thank everybody for listening and, and doing what they can do um, and taking Indigenous peoples, not only our knowledge, but our rights into account as we move forward um, collectively with addressing this um, very critical issue. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, Christian. Um, I would say, you know, I think one of the most important things as regards climate change and politics generally is the fight against cynicism. And in climate change politics, sometimes the science can be so overwhelming that people either don't quite understand it or if they do understand it, then they rather rationally give up all hope and think, how can we've already crossed the line in terms of tipping points, what can we do? So I think part of our job is to fight against cynicism. And the way to do that is to lay out credible paths forward. And, and as regards to that, I think it's important to point out, you know, we have the technology. It's not like we have to invent electric vehicles or electrical grid or distributed solar or commercial scale, utility sale, solar and wind. We have that. Um, we have the money. There's vast public budgets to be used. There's all of that over-accumulated capital that, that can be pointed in, in any direction that governments see fit. Uh, and we even, in the United States, we have the laws, actually. You know, we don't have the political power to use them, but we had Massachusetts versus EPA was a, a lawsuit that said the Environmental Protection Agency has to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. The Bush administration did nothing about this. The Obama administration dragged its feet. Now the Bush, now Trump is, you know, making war on the EPA. But to keep this in mind, that we actually have what we need at hand um, to to make our way forward, and um, and that part of what has to be done at kind of a macro level is to recognize, kind of in in the tradition of what what Andrea was saying, you know, that human beings are environment makers. And that uh, if, when environmentalism falls into a sort of Malthusian sensibility that casts human beings as intruders who only harm this garden called nature, we really have to banish that and recognize that human beings make environments. They, they do that in um, very destructive ways, as is modern capitalism. But we also have a long tradition of, around, traditions around the world of people increasing biodiversity through their environmental practices and, and, and we have to uh, make that that part of our our message that we can be and we have historically been positive environment makers as a species thank you um, and finally professor Harvard do you want to add something yeah, I just want to echo that we have the means available technologically. We have, uh, I think, a lot of examples of how to do things differently. Uh, and the simple question is, why aren't we doing it? Well, the answer is that there's a huge force, mainly uh, arraigned in terms of a capitalist class, an oligarchy, or if you like, which is actually perverting. Uh, most of uh, what we have and most of the capacities that we have into something which is advantageous to themselves. And I think that that is where the battle really lies. And until we can fight that battle uh, I, and do it in a unified way, then I think that uh, we're not going to be able to deploy all of the possibilities which exist us, around us right now to construct an entirely different world with a completely different political uh, an economic uh, system than the one that we currently uh, have created, which is about endless capital accumulation and endless uh, consolidation and massification of capitalist class power. 
And that is what I think we have to be prepared to challenge. Thank you. Um, and thank you again to all of our panelists. I would like to uh, call Vincenzo on, on stage to a couple of closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Costanza. So, uh, as I said, this is the end of a long day. It is uh, 10 plus hours uh, across four different countries. Uh, I have to thank uh, the, the, the UK team, which was an amazing job, and Jay, Danny, Andrew, and Julia. They've been really great. Um, the Yelena from Wake Up, uh, Wake Up Europe Festival in Turin. Uh, James from Budapest uh, um, Coordination. Uh, didn't make it in the end uh, to join, uh, but uh, thank you anyway for all the effort. Jana Merkin, David De Castro for uh, uh, coordinating uh, a group in uh, the Continental <laughs> Coordination. And then there's so many others, uh, DSC, that participated or tried to participate in France, Germany, uh, Italy, Ireland. Uh, Miriam from uh, Cologne, which is going, who is going to organize from there the Transnational Street Fest on June 30th, which we are going to try to participate. We've been invited. Um, and of course the New York team, which is uh, an amazing team, and uh, I, I'm not going to mention everyone, but uh, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, we have a donation box there, and uh, of course uh, uh, join us for, uh, we have constant meetings and we keep organizing uh, events uh, constantly. Thank you all for coming, and thank you all for participating. Thank you guys, good luck. Thank you, thank you again.